On Saturday afternoon, a barge carrying 924,000 gallons of oil crashed into a ship off the coast of Texas City, Texas, sending oil gushing into Galveston Bay, one of the nation's busiest shipping lanes. Early reports from the Coast Guard suggest that as much as 168,000 gallons of toxic bunker oil have leaked into the surrounding waters. While this latest Gulf Coast disaster pales in comparison to, for example, the Exxon Valdez spill that occurred 25 years ago today, it's still a big deal. The Coast Guard has already had to close down the Houston Ship Channel for two days straight, and although it could reopen some parts of that waterway soon, the spill and subsequent shipping lane closure have had a devastating impact on the local economy. Meanwhile, although cleanup is ongoing, the spill has harmed the already fragile Gulf Coast ecosystem. Birds covered in oil have washed up on shore, and environmental groups say that it's likely that the spill has killed whales, fish, and other marine species. As long as our economy depends on fossil fuels like oil, disasters like the Texas City oil spill will continue to happen. It's just a fact. But if we continue on the path we're on, we won't just have to worry about economically and environmentally destructive oil and coal tar ash spills. We'll have to worry about the future of the entire global ecosystem. New research suggests that we could reach the dangerous threshold of 2 degrees Celsius warming as soon as 2036, 22 years from now. Joining me now for more on this is Dr. Michael Mann, distinguished professor at the Department of Meteorology at Penn State University, author of the book The Hockey Stick in the Climate Wars, now out in paperback with a foreword by Bill Nye, the science guy. Dr. Mann is also the author of a new piece titled Earth Will Cross the Climate Danger Threshold in 20, by 2036, which is featured in the April issue of Scientific American. Dr. Michael Mann, welcome back. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Good to be with you. Thank you. So in your piece for Scientific American, you said we could see two degrees Celsius of warming by 2036. How did you arrive at that conclusion and what's the significance of that? Yeah, so two degrees Celsius, uh, about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet relative to pre-industrial time b before we started pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That, that number is often used by scientists as a measure of when we really start to enter into the worst impacts of climate change, the most damaging changes in climate uh, and potentially irreversible changes in, in our climate system. That isn't to say that we aren't already seeing uh, very damaging impacts of climate change when it comes to severe weather, various types of severe weather that are uh, costing us, uh, costing our economy, are doing damage to agriculture, um, extreme heat and drought and wildfire. We're already seeing here in the U.S. Uh, the impacts, the damaging impacts of climate change. But if we go above that two degrees Celsius threshold, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, we really start to see far more damaging impacts. In your, in your article and in your research, you work with and talk about equilibrium climate sensitivity, ECS. What is that? It's a measure of how sensitive the climate is to the greenhouse gases that we are putting into the atmosphere through fossil fuel burning and other activities. Uh, typically, uh, scientists focus, climate scientists focus on that number as a measure of how much warming we are likely to get if we put a certain amount of uh, uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. The best current estimate is that that number is about three degrees Celsius. Um, more than uh, you know, about five degrees Fahrenheit. So what that means is that if we were to double CO2 levels relative to pre-industrial time, we would probably lock in at least three degrees Celsius warming. Obviously, that exceeds that two degrees Celsius number that uh, many scientists feel constitutes the uh, danger threshold. Well, it turns out that we actually have to keep CO2 concentrations quite a bit lower than that if we want to avoid two degrees Celsius. Um, certainly no higher than about 450 parts per million in the atmosphere. This year, or actually last year, for the first time we passed the 400 parts per million mark. For the first time we think in millions of years. We've raised CO2 concentrations now through fossil fuel burning and other human activities to a level the planet hasn't seen in millions of years. And we're adding about three parts per million a year. So if you do the math, we hit that 450 parts per million number in a matter of a couple decades, and we probably lock in at least two degrees Celsius and some very dangerous and potentially irreversible impacts on the planet. On the one hand, we have the, uh, 
to, to, to Fox News folks who say, well, you know, it's, uh, we're already at 400 parts per million and the sky hasn't fallen and things aren't that big a deal. And it's, you know, and, and by the way, the IPCC says 2100. That's, you know, we'll all be dead by then. And then on the other hand, there are some folks who are doing really good imitations of Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, people like Guy McPherson running around saying, you know, it's all over. Uh, we're in hospice now, you know, it's time to pack it in. Um, you're suggesting 22 years. Do you do you see that as 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 the as kind of the rational middle ground? I mean, is it possible that in 22 years we can stabilize CO2, or is this just too big a job? And and if it can be done, what do we do? And what are your thoughts on those two ends of the extreme that I mentioned? Yeah, well, the you know those like you uh, you know as you allude to and Fox News and and uh, some. Uh, uh, other uh, conservative media outlets who, who will tell you that you know things are fine we've already pumped all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and you know we're not seeing the end of the earth um, they're sort of like the person who jumps off the top uh, of a you know 30 store building um, and as he's falling and he passes the third floor says fine so far right. well that's sort of what we're doing right now we're, we are committing to much larger increases in warming with the CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere right now. Uh, it's what we call the legacy uh, of, uh, or, or sometimes we call it the commitment to warming. The CO2 we are putting into the atmosphere right now is going to add to warming for decades into the future. It will cause sea level to rise for centuries into the future. So there's a huge procrastination penalty when it comes to emitting carbon into the atmosphere. If we want to avoid crossing two degree C threshold, um, we're the locomotive uh, that is uh, headed down the tracks full speed ahead. If we slam on the brakes right now, it may take a mile until we stop. And, and that's what's going on with the climate system right now. If we are going to avoid passing that two degree Celsius threshold, we've got to bring our global carbon emissions to a, a peak within the next couple years and start ramping them down several percent uh, per year. Now, it isn't really like a cliff that we are uh, going over. Um, the impacts of climate change are, are more continuous. It's more like a, a road that is ever sloping steeper and steeper downward. And the further down that road we go, uh, the more damaging impacts we commit to. But if we, you know, if we miss the uh, 400 parts per million exit ramp, we still want to take the next exit ramp. And if we miss that one, we still want to take the one after that. Um, we can still avoid crossing that 450 parts per million CO2 level in the atmosphere, but we have to start acting now. There is an urgency to acting unlike anything we've seen before. If we're going to avoid uh, committing to those truly damaging, potentially irreversible changes. It seems that one of the the really the essence of this is, is is passing tipping points that cannot be undone within the, the lifetime of human civilization for example um, what are and and i'm assuming that that's what you're talking about when you're talking about catastrophic outcomes and irreversible outcomes what are the major tipping points that that you're concerned about and what are the temperatures or carbon uh, CO2 levels associated with them. Right. Well, you know, we sometimes talk about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Uh, the things that keep many of us up at night aren't the known unknowns. They aren't the, the uncertainties that we know exist and we are still trying to refine and, and represent as accurately as can within, uh, we can within the models, the climate models that we use to make projections uh, of the future. Um, the thing that keeps us up at night are those things that we haven't even thought about, those potential responses. Um, we're only still learning uh, now that, uh, for example, uh, when we warm uh, the planet, when we warm the permafrost in the Arctic, and when we warm the, the continental shelves of the oceans, uh, there's a large amount of methane. And I know you've covered this before on your show. Um, uh, this is uh, what we sometimes call our, our carbon cycle feedback. There's all this methane that's sort of currently frozen in the ground and if we warm uh, the planet even a bit we may start releasing a lot of that methane into the atmosphere well methane it turns out 
is an even more potent greenhouse gas than the CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning. So that adds further to the warming. It commits us to potentially even greater changes. And so there are uncertainties. Now, you sometimes hear the argument made that, well, uncertainty is a reason for inaction. We don't know for certain that uh, climate change is going to lock in a given amount of warming, uh, uh, give us a certain, you know, a, a given set of changes. And so that uncertainty is sometimes used as an argument for inaction. Well, since we don't know for sure that this will happen or that will happen, uh, why should we take precautions to reduce our emissions? Well, it turns out the, that uncertainty is actually a reason to act even faster because it's just as possible and increasingly it looks like it's more possible that the changes rather than being smaller than we currently estimate may very well be larger. Um, that's certainly true when we look at the rate at which sea ice in the Arctic is melting. It's proceeding faster than the climate models say it should be proceeding. So uncertainty in this case and the existence of uh, unknown unknowns, things that we haven't even imagined and, and, and certainly haven't put into the climate models that could aggravate the problem, that could make it worse. Uh, that is as good an argument for taking action immediately as anything. We have just a, a little more than a half a minute left. You open your article uh, rebutting those who say there's nothing to worry about, that climate increases have leveled off. You want to put that myth to bed? Yeah, it's what I'd like to call the, the faux pause. Um, uh, there's this claim that you see in sort of the denialist fringes of the Internet and, and in some media outlets. Uh, you hear the claim that global warming has stopped um, or that there's a pause in global warming, and it simply isn't true. Um, what is true is that there are some natural factors uh, that have to do with things like El Nino and volcanic eruptions and small changes in, in solar output that have caused the globe to warm a little less than we might have expected over the last decade. Um, but what I did is I took um, the, the last decade of data and I said, well, I'll make this concession to the contrarians. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that we assume that that slowing of global warming somehow means that the climate system is less sensitive to the CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere. And that probably isn't true. But let's assume that it is. I did the same calculation I did before, and it turns out that buys us 10 years. So rather than having 22 years um, to stabilize emissions uh, before we commit to the 2 degrees Celsius warming threshold, uh, we might have an extra 10 years. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that climate change wow. is any less of a problem. It means that maybe we have a bit more time to act before we lock in the most dangerous impact. Right.